Okay, so so far our function doesn't really do much that's interesting, um, but anyways, let's just review. Um, so we have this uh, contract. So somebody in initially uh, launches it. So we'll say it's Alice. She has a certain address. Okay, and so she pushes it uh, to the blockchain. And when she pushes it, uh, she can run the constructor and so she can push an integer uh, inside. Uh, and so what ends up happening is you have this contract where it's basically has an integer that's five. Okay. Then what will happen is let's say Bob wants to change the integer. Uh, what he's going to do is he's going to run set and then maybe he wants to change it to 10. So you'll run set 10 and then the state of the contract will update and now it is uh, 10. Okay. Uh, Bob will do that from some address as well. So he'll that this transaction he will broadcast from a particular address it's signed uh, by this particular address okay uh, and then set will transition and this will always happen assuming that the transaction is well formed actually signed by an address and in particular that Bob uh, in this case pays enough gas uh, so that set will actually run to completion okay there is the option that let's say he doesn't pay enough gas uh, so what it will do is it will start executing. It's not a very long function, but somewhere in the middle it will get caught. Uh, and then when it gets caught, uh, what it will do is it will revert back to the state and it will throw an exception uh, that says, oh, Bob tried to run this, uh, but there wasn't enough gas. Uh, therefore, uh, we'll go back. Okay, so let me, let me actually show that. Uh, so let's say that we have, you know, here's Carol. And so she tries to run set. Uh, but uh, she doesn't pay enough gas and so what ends up happening is we get an out of gas exception and then the state just reverts uh, back to 15 okay uh, now, every time one of these people uh, runs the contract, uh, they're, they're also paying money, okay? So they're paying money in terms of gas, okay? And remember, gas is amount of ether. Uh, so they're basically saying, hey, I'm paying, you know, a, a certain amount in gas, and this is the amount of ether that I'm willing to pay per unit of gas. And uh, every operation, basically every piece of bytecode uh, that um, that Ethereum supports, uh, every operation will have a fixed price in terms of gas. Uh, so the miners will just, first off, they'll look at the ratio and decide whether it's worth it or not uh, to, to run a particular function. And if they decide that they're paying enough ether per unit of gas, then they'll actually run it. Then they'll figure out how much gas it actually consumed they'll take that amount of gas off of the amount of gas that Alice pledged. So she'll, she'll pledge more gas than, it, than is actually used and she'll get uh, the gas returned. And the person taking the gas is the miner. So the miner who puts this transaction, this set 10 or this construction or this set 15, even though it throws an exception, they'll still put it in the blockchain. They'll say, hey, we had this transaction, we did run it, it did run out of gas. All the other miners will verify that, yeah, if, if I run set 15, it runs out of gas too. And the miner will still keep the amount of gas that, that it consumed until it hit that exception. Okay, so anyways, um, forget about the mechanics, let's think about what this function is actually doing. So basically it's kind of like an integer in the cloud. Okay, and I do want to compare uh, Ethereum to a cloud platform because they maybe sound like they're, they're solving similar things. Uh, Ethereum, when we see how much gas actually costs, uh, it's very expensive. Okay, so this is not really like a cloud environment. A cloud environment's meant for really large data, complicated computations and things like that. Ethereum is really for like lightweight data, lightweight algorithms and uh, that type of thing. So now let's start modifying this contract to do things that are, are sort of, that Ethereum are, is better at. Let's start leveraging the fact that we're playing with a cryptocurrency. So the first thing we're going to do is, well, two things we're going to do. One is we're going to add finance 
uh, to this contract. We'll do that next, but the first thing I wanna do is let's just lock down this function a little bit. So right now we have a situation where anybody can come along and set, set this integer to whatever they want. Um, what we can do is because it's a cryptocurrency and every transaction is coming from an, an address, so Alice has an address, Bob has an address, Carol has an address, uh, and when they launch their functions, uh, what they do is they actually sign it with the key that corresponds to their address. So you actually know who it is that's coming along and trying to run these functions. And what you can do is you can define code that says, um, let's look and see who, who is it that's actually trying to run this function. And you can say, yeah, they're allowed to run it or no, uh, we don't want them uh, to run it, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this function and I'm gonna add a few lines of code that are just gonna modify the set function. Okay, so what I want at the end of the day is I want to have a set function where uh, only uh, somebody can, can run it. And in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say whoever it is that launched this contract, right, whoever it was that run, ran the constructor on this contract, whoever put the source code up and, and ran it for the first time, they're going to be considered the owner. Okay, so when the address gets constructed, or sorry, when the contract gets constructed, I'm going to look and see who was the person uh, that, that launched this contract. I'm going to write them their address into a variable. So I'm going to create a new variable. I'm going to write their address into a variable. And then uh, when it comes time to run the set, uh, before I let uh, the X that's passed in overwrite stored data, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick check to see whether their their address matches uh, the person who constructed uh, the contract. Okay, so if I make all these changes, uh, the results that I get uh, is going to look like so. Okay, so this is the exact same contract, it just has a few extra lines of code. Um, so just to highlight them, uh, the first thing I did is I added a new variable that's going to keep track of an address. Okay, so the address I call owner. Okay, so this is going to be the owner of the contract. Okay, so this is a new variable. And who's the owner? Who is it? Whose address ends up in this owner variable? Well, it's going to get set during the constructor. Okay, so somebody's going to come along and they're going to take this code and they're going to push it for the very first time to Ethereum's blockchain. And at that time, what happens is the function, actually every single function that you run is called message. Okay, so anytime you run a function, it's called, uh, it's called a message. And you can always ask, who is the person that just sent this message? Okay, and so uh, this is denoted message.sender. And the mental model here is, it's, it's a little confusing, but let's think about what happens. Um, this code gets, well, first off, it gets compiled, so it turns into bytecode, but the, the bytecode equivalent of this gets sent to the miner. So the miner takes this code and they say, hey, I received this code from Alice, and Alice's address is ABC. And so what they'll do is they'll say, okay, message.sender, they'll go through the code and every time they see message.sender, they'll fill in ABC, okay? Now, if Bob was the one who pushed this code, then they would fill in Bob's address here, okay? So this corresponds to whoever it was that ran this function, uh, they're the person that's, their address is in message.sender, okay? So the only person to run this, because this is the constructor, it only gets run the very first time. Um, or it does get run the first time. I shouldn't say only. I mean, you can call this function if you want. Um, but uh, the very first time it, it gets run is when you push the contract for the very first place. And so what I'll do is I'll store whoever it is uh, in owner uh, in the owner variable. Okay, so this is the next line of, of code that's new. Now, what that means is, let's say Alice wants to have a contract like this where only she can set um, the integer, and Bob wants to have the exact same contract in Ethereum where only he can set the integer, they can actually use the exact same code. It's not like they have to go and hard code their address into the code. Uh, they can use the exact same code, and when Alice launches it, then her address gets set in owner, and when Bob launches his version, which will be stored at a different address, um, 
then his personal address uh, gets stored in owner. Okay, so there'll be two versions of this contract at different contract addresses on the Ethereum blockchain. And uh, one of them will have the owner as Alice and the other will have the owner as, as Bob. Okay, uh, personal addresses, that's actually not a technical term. Uh, usually we call them external addresses. So an address that's a simple address that's owned by you know, a user is called an external address. And then when contracts are written and pushed to an address, they're called contract addresses. Okay. Uh, so, and the other thing I'll note too, is that a contract could push this as well. So you could have a contract that says, Hey, I want, I want to create simple storage, uh, object, and I want to put it on the blockchain. And so message.center, uh, could actually be a contract address. It, it's not necessarily an external address that belongs to a user, okay? But it's basically whoever calls this in the first place, uh, they're the ones that, that get this uh, written into owner. Okay, um, then, uh, so the next thing uh, that we do is uh, we wanna make sure that set can only be run uh, by the owner, okay? So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to add a line of the code. So we could do an if else statement. If, if, if message.center equals owner, then overwrite it with X and then just leave the else condition, um, the else condition uh, blank, okay? So that has one net result, which is that this function will run to completion. Notice that, that let's say message.center is Alice Bob still runs set. Even if Bob isn't the owner, he still calls set. The, the miners will still go into this function and they'll execute every single line of code until they hit a condition that says stop executing, okay? So I, I wanna be clear that the semantics of this is not that Bob can't run set. It's just that when Bob does run set uh, and this first line of code runs, uh, what require will do is if this condition is not true is it will throw an exception. Okay, so for Bob, uh, this will throw an exception. Uh, assuming that this is Alice, um, so we'll soon. Okay, the exception will consume as much gas as it took to get to the end of this line of code, uh, and then it will revert the state. So it'll be as if Bob never came along and ran this function, okay? The fact that he did though run it and it threw this exception will be recorded in the blockchain, okay? So require is a, an error condition that just throws an exception. Um, there, basically when you hit an error, you can decide whether you wanna throw an exception or if you want to just kind of return a false or, or have your code handle uh, what happens uh, when this, and so there's different reasons why you might wanna do different things, right? An exception, I wanna be very clear, when you throw an exception and it reverts the state, it reverts all the work that you did. So let's say that like, let's say you have a contract and you're going to, we haven't talked about money yet, but let's say you're going to pay 10 different people. So you pay the first person, then you pay the second person, then you pay the third person. And for some reason, when you pay the third person, it throws an exception it's going to revert everything. So person one and two will not get paid. Sometimes that's not what you want. Sometimes you, if person three can't get paid for some reason, you still want person one and two to have been paid and then maybe you skip over person three and you go on to four, five, six. Okay, so uh, throwing an exception isn't always the right answer. Um, but anyways, that's that's what require does. So it's a special function that, that basically says, is this true or not? And if it's not true, it just throws an exception and reverts the state. Okay, so this is a nice little contract, little smart contract now, uh, where uh, we record uh, who the owner is, uh, and then we require the owner to be the only person who will be able to run uh, this set function.